Subhanallah, one time he, we finished the Salah, we prayed beside each other and I waited for him to finish his dhikr and things like that. Then I wanted to ask a question. And so I said, uh, yeah, Shah, and I asked him permission to, to ask a question. And he told me, one second, yeah, yeah, Ibn, he said, you know, my son, give me a moment. Okay. Uh, and then I saw him, subhanAllah, picking up whatever he can find of like small specks of, of dirt or anything he can find, lint or anything he can find in the masjid in, term, in order to fulfill any nadafat uh, al-masjid, Yeah, yeah. Taking whatever he could find, like specks or anything, that he can see, take it and put it in his thaw pocket here. He was just after, he was just after Ajr. Yeah, after Ajr. Harakatuhum wa humumuhum wa uzumuhum Lillahi la lil khalqi wa shaytani Ni'mal rafiq li talib al-subul al-lati Tufdi ila al-khayrat wal-ihsan Tufdi ila al-khayrat wal-ihsan Bismillah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah Fallahumma khfil lana, wa li walidina, wa li sami'in, wa li jami'in muslimin ajma'in Aqsa Allah Azza wa Jal, the Almighty Jalla Jalalu to make this gathering a beneficial one to forgive us, our parents, our scholars and all the Muslims deceased or alive to forgive them all and to grant us all Jannat al-Firdaus al-A'la Aqsa Allah Azza wa Jal and yaj'al hadha al-liqa wa hadha al-majlis and yakun khalis and yawajhin kareem wa yaj'al kul ma natalafad wa naqool and yakun khalis and yawajhin kareem wa yitqabbal minna of course Today is another day, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. I'm joined with my dear brother Abu Saleh Ilyas on the second part of remis reminiscing with the scholars or reminiscing the scholars. And this is part two. And their intent for this is just to speak with the brother and discuss with him his benefits, his story, his journey with the gods of the scholars and that which he is able to remember. So if you can begin, Akhil Kareem, and introduce yourself. Barakallahu feekum. as you said, inshallah, this, this topic and this talk, which will shed some light on uh, some of the benefits that the students um, you know, witness or, or, or are, are blessed with um, with their time here uh, studying, as you yourself know and are familiar with from studying in uh, Al Jamia Al Islamiyah. Um, inshallah, in today's, um, you know, following your your first audio that you did or your first uh, sitting or majlis on this topic, reminiscing regarding the ulama, uh, and inshallah, we'll continue with the same scholar as we both alhamdulillah were able to benefit from him uh during our time here in the mamlaka uh, as students and that is uh sheikh rabi muhadi al-madkhali hafidhullah wa ra'ah um i'll start inshallah ta'ala with mentioning when it was first that i ever heard of the sheikh and who is it that i first heard him uh from and so when i Alhamdulillah, I first started practicing and, and learning about as Salafiya. Uh, the first individual that took me by the hand um, after yani, leaving what I was upon previously, uh, not, not in terms of uh, any type of sect or anything like that, but I was not, uh, it, I didn't have any connection to do with, uh, with the deen. But Alhamdulillah, a Salafi Merkaz opened up in my neighborhood that I lived in. And um, there was a student of knowledge. That's in Canada, there. right? That? In That's Canada. in Canada, right? And, uh, so in, in Ottawa, Canada, the capital of Canada. At that time, uh, when I just finished high school, um, or maybe about a year before I finished high school, um, this matter opened up. I uh, wasn't practicing still then, but 
alhamdulillah, due to that Merkaz opening up, um, the first place I went to when I started to think about practicing and after experiencing certain things in my life and knowing that I needed to change uh, my lifestyle, alhamdulillah, Allah provided and blessed me with a Salafi Merkaz in the neighborhood that I lived in. Uh, called Dar al-Sahaba, uh, Dar al-Sahaba in, in Ottawa, in the west end of Ottawa, Canada. And um, and so when I first went there, went there, I attended the durus that were that were going on at that time, um, in in different places. So some of them happened at the musalla itself, uh, Dar al-Sahaba. Um, others there was also a maktaba at that time for Dar al-Sahaba as well, also in the west end. And so we had classes there too. Okay. And main mosque, is there, those who are familiar with Ottawa, they know that the main mosque of Ottawa, um, which is still in the West End, but close to, to downtown, uh, we had classes there as well. Um, so without me knowing what Salafia was or anything like that, I attended his durus, and he was the first person that introduced me to anything, uh, you know, any sort of seeking of knowledge or any form of seeking, seeking knowledge and learning Islam in that way. I did not even know before that that, that existed in, in, in our religion. I knew you remember Quran and that's it, you know, from a young age. But like that you seek knowledge and that there's books teaching Islam. I had no idea about any of that. So Alhamdulillah, from the durus that I that I attended at that time for Al-Arbain um, al he was teaching at the time. Um, he was also doing um, Something that's subhanAllah, I haven't seen even after him um, or even any books on it. I, and I could be just, it could be due to my lack of knowledge. But he was doing tafsir ayat al tawheed or ayat al aqeedah. So he started from and he was doing tafsir just like as we have, you know, tafsir ayat al ahkam and that's known yeah. as mustaqil. Uh, he was doing tafsir ayat al tawheed. And so starting from Baqarah, he was doing that. And we benefit a lot from that. Uh, there was also another student of knowledge at the time. Uh, well, often I didn't mention who he was. I was about to ask you, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, so we forgot to mention who he was. Uh, Abu, uh, Abu, Abu Abdurrahman Muhammad Ali Ajjal, al Libi. Uh, so he's Libyan and oh, originally, sure. you know, uh, a Canadian citizen. So he was in Ottawa, alhamdulillah, spreading uh, the Salafi da'wah in the city of Ottawa, Canada at the time. And um, so other than him, there was also others who helped him in da'wah and they, they knew their work together in, in teaching. Um, from them was Abu Mu'tasim, a Sudani. There was also a Sudani. And he was teaching Talbis Iblis, Talbis Iblis of Ibn Jawzi at the time, which was very, very beneficial for me at that time, leaving you know, the lifestyle that I was in and needing you know, a purification of the heart. Um, and knowing the deceptions of shaitan and, and how he deceives you and these things. So yeah. it was a very good thing for me at that time when I started practicing. It's something that um, helped strengthen my, uh, my iman. Um, and then so he was the first one, Abu Abdurrahman, Muhammad Ali Allah. He was the first one that I ever heard, uh, you know, sought knowledge abroad and, and, and the name of Sheikh Rabia and Sheikh Ubaid and um, Al Albani and Ibn Uthaymeen, Ibn Baz, these names, the first time I ever heard of them were from him. And at that time, I was about 18 years old. So um, I heard about also his studies. So he studied in Al Jamia Al Islamiyah. So he's a graduate. Um, I believe in the early 90s he graduated, but he was in Medina in the late 80s. So he was a very close student to Sheikh Rabia and to Sheikh Abdul Musin Abbad um, and uh, other Mashaykh as well. He benefited from Sheikh Hamad al um, and other than them. Sheikh Yusuf al takhil if, if you remember, if you know him or heard of him, yeah. Mashaykh passed away now. Um, so there's a, you know, a lot of Mashaykh that through our sittings with him, Sheikh Saleh Suhaimi also, very close to him. Um, and then others who are now known as, you know, the ulama, but they were his zumala at that time, or even younger than him. Sheikh Sulaiman al Muhammad bin Hadi, um, they were also uh, around at that time, and he knew he knew them since then. And so Sheikh Rabi'ah, the first time I ever uh, heard of him 
was from him. Um, and then obviously what's out there on the internet is, you know, he's this and he's that, and there's a Madkhali sect and all these things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was a big thing actually back that, sorry to interrupt you, actually, that was a big thing back in, you know, when we were growing up as teenagers, it was a thing where we actually, or many people believe that even me and myself, I was confused. Like, what does this mean? You know, yeah. this sect, and it's like and people kind of believe is actually a sect that actually exists. Exactly. And uh, obviously anyone who knows that knows that that's, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as Madakhila or anything like that. Mm. Or, or of, of Sheikh Rabi as if it's like a sect or anything like that. That's just from the Kaid and the plot and the, and the, and the schemes of, of, of Ahl al-Bid'ah. Because Sheikh Rabi, as we know, is known to have um, achieved the sword against Ahl al-Bid'ah, uh, modern day Ahl al-Bid'ah in his time. And so that, that angers them and that, you know, uh, causes them to say to attack him in this way. Mm. Uh, anyone you know, uh, does, is involved in rudud against Ahl al-Bid'ah or, or, or these types of things um, and, and takes the people back to the way of the Salaf in dealing with Ahl al-Bid'ah, etc. They just yeah. uh, call him a Madkhali and that's it, you know, in order to, to silence them. And so the reality is that, that there's no basis to that, to that terminology. Um, and it's only an attack on, on Sheikh Rabbi Hafidullah. Um, so, so when did you actually meet the, 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 the Sheikh Rabbi in Mecca? How did it go about? So for me afterwards, when I learned about Sheikh Rabbi through Sheikh Abu Rahman, Muhammad Ali Ajjal, uh, I, and, and learning about his studies and the fact that he studied and then hearing about others who also went abroad to study and that there's Islamic universities, I myself then wanted to apply yeah. for the universities. Alhamdulillah, I was blessed to make Umrah uh, at the end of my high school year or that summer and I went to visit uh, Al Jamia Islami and I saw students and things like that so yeah. motivation to want to study so um, at that time subhanAllah I was supposed to I had like dreams and aspirations to be a forensic scientist believe it or not and I was good in it we could have been contacting you Habibi <laughs> <laughs> and so Hala, I wanted to, and I was accepted to university and everything uh, in a program called Criminology uh, and Concentration in Psychology, and I didn't end up going. I, and I was registered in my classes and everything, but because I had the passion to now want to seek knowledge filled my heart, I had no more, I, d I didn't have really a desire to, um, to study that anymore, and I worked to try to apply to those universities. So I did apply to Medina and Um al Qura, and, uh, but I didn't get accepted right away. So I waited about two years before I got accepted. And so when I didn't get accepted in the first year, I waited and uh, I just went to the western part of Canada and worked uh, for about a year, almost a year, uh, in these oil fields uh, in Alberta, an area called Alberta in so when you went to Safi, sorry, sorry. So when you went to Alberta at the time, you had no intention to go and pursue that career in terms of uni and study. And then, so you applied. So can you say you were kind of longing to get accepted? Was that what it was? Or yeah. So I want. Yeah, I just had the by any means necessary. I was going to to study there. So at that time, I went to Alberta to, to save a bit of money and okay. just to wait it out to see if I do get accepted. So I did first wait the first year. When I didn't get accepted. I didn't go in, in, into uni, I went straight to just work and save money uh, with the hopes that I could get accepted. And then, alhamdulillah, I got accepted. Um, and then, I, and then I, I, what I was really aiming for was Medina. I wanted to be in Medina. Yeah. But alhamdulillah, I got accepted to Umm al -Qura. And so when I got accepted to Umm al -Qura, I knew it was in Mecca, and in Mecca is Sheikh Rabia. So that was one of the things that I was most happy about was okay. um, uh, that I was going to be able to benefit from from Sheikh Rabia, knowing especially that he was in you know at, at an old age at the time, and inshallah that I was able to reach there uh, before he passes or before I even pass, and be able to benefit from him. So in um, ja uh, January 2013, I came to the Mamlaka. I got accepted before that, but I didn't come the first semester. I came the second semester, okay. and alhamdulillah, uh, I was able to attend his durus. So. Um, I did actually meet him before that though. When I came, I came for Umrah in 2011, and that was the first time I actually met him. But it was only attending one lesson, the same the same lesson that I started attending when I came as a student. 
but it started a couple of years before I got there. But uh, I attended um, just one lesson and, and saw him. For the first time. That was uh, subhanAllah amazing uh, just to see him for the first time uh, and, and be able to benefit. And I saw the amount of students in his house and, and everything. But it didn't really give me a um, true idea of what it would be like to study with him, you know, on a consistent But alhamdulillah, at least I was able to see him and give him salam and, uh, and, then, uh, and then go back to. Uh, Medina, I was in Medina. I didn't get to see him in Mecca when we were doing Umrah. We started in Mecca, but he was sick. And then Medina, and then I back then, Sahab, you remember Sahab.net? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sahab, there was uh, like an Elan on Sahab that he was feeling better. And that uh, now the class is, is, is on. So I won Fajr, I prayed Fajr, Mashid the Nabawi, took those Naqal Jama'i, those vans. Yeah, went, yeah cool. <laughs> went straight to Mecca. I got there in the morning. Uh, prayed Jum'ah in the Haram and a brother, an American brother who was studying back then at that time, he picked me up and we went to the Dars together, alhamdulillah. And then afterwards, after Isha, I went right back to Medina, subhanAllah, same day. SubhanAllah. Okay, and your Arabic, was it, a, was it a good level to understand and digest all of the information? Not at all. At that time, I could just understand. The thing that helped me was um, I had never studied Arabic like uh, in detail prior to when I came to the Mamlaka. But because I'm fluent, alhamdulillah, in my own native language, yeah. um, we have a lot of Arabic vocabulary. Yeah, so yeah. that helped me in, in understanding the gist of things. So, okay. so I wasn't able to understand him word for word, but I was able to get the gist of things. And because he was teaching some topics at the time, Aqidah, to do with uh, Arkan al Iman and stuff, some of it was familiar. So I could understand, alhamdulillah, from that dars. Um, also, first came in. First studying, same thing. I was in the Ma'had. So I was still attending the lessons, but wasn't grasping everything uh, when I first uh, started attending. But from the benefits at that time, um, because Sheikh Rabi and who he is, you know, to the Salafis and to the, to the Salafis worldwide uh, and the respect and their love for him, um, his lesson, which was in his Maktaba in Mecca at the time, Fridays after Asr, um, anytime Mashaykh from other countries would come visit Mecca and come for Umrah. They would come by the house on that day where that when that lesson was going on. And so from the benefits of Alhamdulillah attending his dirus was that I met and, and saw so many mashaykh that are from other countries that I thought I would never see or you know uh, could not believe that I was seeing for the first time in person. And so all of that happened. Can I, can I just, sorry, can I just stop you there? I wanna, I wanna touch on something if you can elaborate because it's something I think that needs to be clarified what you're saying, the Mashaykh coming to visit, is there any sort of connection or alaqa, maslaha for them to come visit the Sheikh because of his name or because of his lineage, because of his race, because of the language he speaks, because of his wealth or because of anything or business transaction or is there something else? Because I think that's something that's very, very important, you know, because he's a human being. May Allah preserve him just like all the rest of the Mashaykh. But what's the reason all of these Mashaykh that are coming to do perform Umrah are coming specifically to see him and all the other people that they visit from regards to the Mashaykh and friends and family, whatever. And uh, so Sheikh Rabia, just like any other scholar of, of Ahl Sunnah, uh, visiting them and, 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 and trying to go there and benefit from them, etc., is is something noble and something to be done. Um, him specifically, though, why they would, um, some of them, either their, their actual connection to him, some of them are his students. Okay. So they're, in their own right now, but when they, you know, studied in, in, in Saudi or when they were there, they were from the ones either who benefited from him um, or have a close connection to him. So from that is visiting someone who, you know, they love and, and respect and honor due to his juhud in, in serving this deen and, and, and protecting uh, the sunnah from being infiltrated by the, by the people of innovation. And so yeah. due to Due to that, they would always take the opportunity, not because of his shakhsiyyah, but because of um, his juhud and, and, and what he's done for the Salafi da'wah. And with his, which is witnessed by even Mashaykh of, of, of the past, who've praised him for that. Shaykh al-Albani and Ibn Uthaymeen and Ibn Baz, etc. Um, yeah. Who knew him to be someone who um, uh, yeah, he had, you know, he strove hard in, in, in protecting the Salafi da'wah from the the corruption and the falsehood of the people of innovation and so and that and that was it in reality um 
uh, and they knew that there was a lesson on that day, so they came and benefited from the lesson and to give the Sheikh salam and maybe sit with them, etc. But to be, you know, to, to be taken as if like it's a, it's it's part of their or their umrah or their hajj, you know, it's part of the rights hajj, you know, to visit Sheikh Rabi' or uh, that you know if you do not visit Sheikh Rabi' uh, and you come for umrah, that there's something wrong with your salafi, etc. None of that is true, and, yeah. and all of that is ghulu. Um, and that if anyone says it from like the Salafi Mashiach, what they mean is that you should strive. To. Not that yeah. well, your Salafiyyah is in question if you do not, but in reality, you would just love to. Just like in the time of the past, there would be people who would say and ask about the people of a particular land, for example, in, in Bukhara at the time, and they would say, Do you know, do you take from Muhammad bin Ismail al Bukhari? And they would not. And they would say, No. And they would say, La khaira fikum. They would say, There's no good in you. Yeah. It's not the fact that because if you do not take from Bukhari, when you could possibly you could possibly also be taken from other imams, that it means you know you're, you're a Salafi or you ascribing to the Sunnah means nothing. No, it means that you've missed out on a lot of khair, and yeah. that's that's all that's meant. You know, because of the knowledge, obviously, because of the knowledge that specific individual, like you gave example, Sheikh uh, Sheikh Rabi or Imam Bukhari, and for example, if, even if you look at it, Subhanallah, I remember it was a beautiful benefit that um, the teacher uh, taught us in Tadween Sunnah regarding those that used to travel for knowledge. So I think it's like in terms of, for those that don't understand, um, you know, the importance of trying to, it's like, for example, when someone goes and you're going to go on a journey, some people, they travel the world to, you know, because it's a hobby, they love it and whatever. But those that love knowledge, they travel for it. So when they know someone possesses a certain hadith or knowledge or what have you, then they'll go and visit that person and benefit from them. And that's the reason why, I think the uh, you're mentioning that the Mashaykh will come from abroad or others will his students and they'll come and visit him. Sahih. And also a lot of <laughs> yeah, no, sahih, that's true. And sometimes what would happen is that in certain countries maybe there's certain fitan or or issues between Mashaykh. And so they would come to him to visit it as someone who is like a walid, someone who's been around, you know, down yeah. for years and helped do Islam between, you know, Salafi Mashaykh or students and things like that throughout history. And so sometimes that was the case. But they would go back to him as someone trustworthy uh, in yeah. that bad. Um, so Alhamdulillah, from the, just to mention off the top of my head, the Mashaykh that I, in my time in Mecca, um, and especially at the house of Sheikh Rabia, uh, met for the first time there, um, from them is Sheikh, for example, Sheikh Falah Mundikar, Rahimahullah, passed away mm. from them, Sheikh Muhammad Al Anjari, Ahmed Al Subayi, uh, from uh, uh, the Yemeni Mashaykh, a lot of them, Abdul Aziz Al Burai, uh, Muhammad Al Somali, uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Al Adni, Rahimahullah, uh, mm. Sheikh Abdul Adni, Hafidullah, um, Sheikh uh, Muhammad Al Imam, Hafidullah, Abdullah Al Dimari, Hafidullah, uh, uh, Ahmed Al Wasabi, Hafidullah, uh, Muhammad Ba Musa, Hafidullah. Those are many, many, all of them at one time. I saw them at Others, um, who else? The Somali Mashaykh. SubhanAllah, some of the Somali Mashaykh, I went to Somalia, I didn't see them there. But when I in Mecca, I met them, SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Abdullah Al Barbarawi. Abdul Kareem Hassan Hosh, uh, Muhammad Abdul Bahir, uh, Sheikh Uthman Mu'allim himself, even though he's in Medina. Yeah. Uh, first time I met him was in Mecca before even in Medina, in a, in a Dawra. Uh, so a lot of the Somali Mashaykh I was able to meet in Mecca during Hajj time when they come to visit, etc. Um, and there's, I'm sure there's others, but I'm forgetting. Uh, okay, there must have been a sense of aura. There must have been like some sort of vibe when you know the Mashaykh would come and the Sheikh Sheikh Rabi would, you know, host them and yeah. And, and from the benefits is that in the lesson, so if, if those Mashaykh are there, um, yeah. after we'll cut his lesson short and give them the opportunity to give a small kalima. Long. And, yeah. Long. So got to benefit from them. And then usually, like for example, the Somali, the Yemeni Mashaykh, when they would come, there would also be like a kind of like a dawra or like an istiraha or something where we got to benefit of them, uh, alhamdulillah. So that was um, uh, beneficial. Also, because when I first came, I was studying in the Ma'had yeah. and not yet, 
even Sheikh Ahmed Bazmoun, for example, the first time I met him was at Sheikh Rabi house because he was the Qari for Sheikh uh, Rabi. Yeah. yeah, he was the one reading uh, yeah. in the house, reading the Matan. And the book that um, so I'll mention, what I was studying when, we first, when I first got there, what he was teaching and the Sheikh was teaching was Ma'araj uh, al-Qaboon of Al-Hafid al-Hakami. And that, that was on Fridays after Asr. And Wednesday after uh, uh, after Isha, Wednesday evenings, he was teaching. It was a private lesson. It originally started as a private lesson, but then slowly we, we were able to sneak in, alhamdulillah, and, and uh, <laughs> get in there through, you know, brothers that we knew and stuff like that. And uh, it was Ilal uh, al-Tirmidhi. He was teaching Ilal al-Tirmidhi, alhamdulillah. So that, at that time, was way above my level. But at least there were some things that I, I, you know, I was able to keep with yeah. My intention eventually was to study hadith. And so at least something, some things I would have been able to, you know, re recollect or write down. And then once I'm, you know, more grounded in the science of hadith, be able to benefit from those notes. So alhamdulillah, I was able to attend that. Uh, my time with Sheikh Rabi in Mecca was about two years and a bit, two years and a half, uh, until he eventually moved. Uh, to Al Medina. Um, so, other than the durus and the mashaykh that you know I was able to benefit from, uh, there are some things that I had personal experiences with the sheikh. Even though there weren't many, um, I wasn't like a you know um, from the khawas you know that you know ride with him in the car and go into his house with him and, and, and nothing like that. But alhamdulillah, I was able to uh, sit with him in his house, you know, sometimes privately. Um, because there weren't many people there, so he would just invite us. We pray with him in his masjid. Yeah. And since no one's really there, he would say, Tafadru in al bayt. We would go to his house. Uh, he would serve us some tea or coffee and dates and things like that. Um, and then we would, we would be able to benefit. Uh, one of the I things. I guess at that time his trunk was much, was, he was much stronger, obviously, because the time when he came to Medina, roughly around 86 years old, he was, you know, you could tell the Sheikh was in his last stages in terms of strength wise. Even in even in Mecca, sometimes we would see. So sometimes I would be able, I would pray with him. In yeah. his masjid, for anyone who knows, you know, small masjid in Mecca. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't anyone there or anything like that, other than just the driver. I would take him by the hand and help him, you know, walk towards the car, and put his shoes in mm -hmm. front of him, and and help him, get, you know, get in, get into the car. So even then, he he was he was getting pretty weak. Sometimes classes were canceled because he was sick, etc. So. Even then, it kind of it kind of uh, you know happened, uh, but yes, it was way it was way more in, in Medina definitely. Yeah. Uh, so from the things that I was able to uh, benefit from, from him is uh, is some things that I witnessed just from afar, or like being with him in the masjid or sitting beside him in the masjid and things like that um, that I witnessed from the sheikh sometimes from his tawadu. I would see after we would pray Salah, and I would sometimes drive just to pray there with him, so I'm hoping he would be there and I can ask him a question. Yeah. And he, uh, SubhanAllah, one time, he, we finished the Salah, we prayed beside each other, and I waited for him to finish his dhikr and things like that, Then I wanted to ask a question. And so I said, uh, and I asked him permission to, to ask a question, and he told me, one second, yeah, Ibn, I said, you know, my son, give me a moment. Okay. Uh, and then I saw him, subhanAllah, picking up whatever he can find of like small specks of, of dirt or anything he can find, lint or anything he can find in the masjid in, term, in order to fulfill any nadafat uh, al-masjid, Yeah, yeah. Taking whatever he could find, like specks or anything that he can see, take it and put it in his thaw pocket here. He's just after Ajr. Yeah, after Ajr. You know, so, as we know, like from the Hadith of Prophet that not to belittle any form of uh, of good deeds, even if it's to give uh, half a tamar or even if it's to smile in the, in the face of your brother. So, subhanAllah, the, in cleaning the house of Allah is from the, 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 the deeds that are great in the sight of Allah, but we sometimes don't even think about. We pray and we walk out of the masjid. Yeah. So that also showed like the nazara of the ulama showed me that they don't belittle any moment to to to, to gain ajr subhanallah so i waited and that subhanallah moved me 
when I saw that. To the point I forgot my question afterwards when I wanted to ask. Why <laughs> <laughs> watching him do that shocked me somehow. Allah that it touches you, doesn't it, Akhir? Because Akhir Allah, and that's the thing I want to I want to branch off on and obviously just make a point and you can go back and you can carry on. Is that for us it's like you know, you come from the West, you hear about these or whatever, you don't know much, and then you would expect to see certain things that are, you know, sometimes it's like some individuals they expect to see some sort of miracles with yeah. regards from you know the actions of the scholars and stuff, but Something so small that we don't even see, like picking up something from the masjid, is not something that everyone does every day. It's very rare for you, for it to be in your day to day, you know, um, routine. And then you see, huh? Someone who cleans the masjid, so you just leave it to them. Exactly, exactly. Whether it's a local masjid or masjid Nabawi, because you you know someone is allocated and that's their you know role or their job. For you, it's like okay, I'm going to pray and leave if you if you're on job if you're working for those that work in the west or whatever. Or I'm going to pray, do what I need to do in the lesson, and then just leave. But for you to now go out your way to go visit the sheikh and you have a question, of course, it's going to move you here to the extent where you forget your question. <laughs> question, subhanallah. And then, uh, alhamdulillah, I remembered afterwards. I think I was able to ask him, and he, he gave me an answer. That was one moqif I saw from him that increased my iman and showed me like the difference between the ulama to ourselves and yeah. that when it says that yeah indeed and the people of knowledge are those who fear Allah the most are the people of knowledge yeah uh, they are those who, who, who fear Allah are the people of knowledge that any the, the the reality of that hadith and the example of it I saw and with Shaykh Rabi and other than him subhanAllah yeah. another, another moqif um, that I witnessed from him is that once again one time walking out of the masjid with him and asking him some masail to do with manhaj um, yeah. we walk and once we got outside and he's beside his car before he got into the car there was a bin like a big garbage bin outside the masjid and he saw cats like running into the garbage and trying to get food and the, st the chef started crying so he started crying Allah and he said وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمَ اللَّهُ بَنِي Adam." he said that made me cry somehow. Uh -huh. I would never have n even thought of that, you know, by seeing that. Just cats. For those that don't understand Arabic, if you can just ex ex yeah, explain to me. Indeed, Allah has honored mankind, he said. Of the, uh -huh. you know, the Adam, that Allah honored us. Yeah, and, he, and he started crying and his voice was like cracking up. And he said, uh, look, Allah did not put us in that situation that we have to jump into a garbage bin to try to find something to eat. And we have everything. Uh -huh need we have and you know in, indeed Allah uh, honored us so subhanAllah he saw that cat and what it, what it did for him is different from us we would probably see oh look at these cats some of us might even chase the cats away or whatever you know whatever mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but him subhanAllah that's how he he, he he saw that and that moved me also emotionally and and that also started to tell me or show me that we were we were cheated in the West and yeah. I say that we never heard this side of Sheikh Rabia. Yeah, yeah. All the the only surah that we ever got of Sheikh Rabia, the only image that we ever got is Rudud, 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 refutation, refutation, refutation. To be that one, that's the only thing that was imported to us in the West. As up until were. today, actually. What's that? I said up until today, Allah, unfortunately. Up until today, yeah, sadly. So when. And, and, and that's why sometimes you don't really blame the masakeen who have an evil, you know, evil thoughts of Sheikh Rabi or believe he's some sort of, um, you know, extremist because of the image of those who uh, attribute themselves to him. The image yeah. that they and their own actions have made people hate him and other than him, uh, from yeah. the, which is sad. And so that started to show me that Sheikh Rabi is more than just Imam of Jarfa Ta'adil and more than just this and that. Um, although, yes, he's a human being, you, you see, and he's right sometimes and he makes mistakes sometimes, but yeah. there's a side of him, a side of taqwa, a side of muraqaba of Allah, you know, having piety, a side of um, uh, yani, yani knowing that Allah is watching him, having yeah. this, sense, you know, this sense and this acknowledgement that in every moment, Allah is watching him, and, and you see that with the ulama. When you spend time with them, you see that that they they're careful in certain things, and they they see certain things different than we see, etc. And um, 
So that, when I started to see these things from Shaykh Rabia, I started to notice that Allah uh, this is what should be portrayed to the, to the people in the West. Or this, not just from him, but the ulama in general. That these things should be mentioned to the brothers and sisters in the West for them to know and have a love and an honor and a respect for the ulama. Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, if you, in the contrary, if you only portray to them that that scholar is only refuting and only has shidda, this and this and that, even if it might be correct, even if the time that he has shidda may have been correct, or the yeah. person he, he may have been correct in, but if that's all you show people, eventually they get turned off by it because they more than just that. The gene, the dean is just is more than just that. So, and uh, the sad thing is, only when you get to spend time with the ulama and you're able to see them in their own home and and how they are in their own home. Sometimes Sheikh Rabia, like seeing him not in his regular clothing, in the clothing like in his own home, you know how he dresses in his own home with the thobe dakhili, like the the thobe that you wear, you know, at home and no taqiya. No had and no, no. You see him in the, in the in his natural state, basically in in his, in his home. And you see yeah. how he, uh, and you see his sense of humor, and you see you know different things and how he teases you, and you, you don't get that side um, when you when you uh, uh, see some of the individuals who constantly mention his name, and uh, and try to attribute themselves as the closest ones uh, to him. And subhanAllah, one benefit that I got from Sheikh Abu Abd Rahman, Muhammad Ali Ajjal, years ago, and which is something that stuck with me forever, was the closeness to the ulama that people claim uh, is an incorrect closeness. And the reality is the closeness to the ulama is, is, a, is a closeness of ilm. That is what it should be. That's the asal. This is that you're close because of ilm. The, ben the benefit, the amount of benefit you attained from this uh, scholar. And we know that from even when you see the tabaqat in, in, in Jahwa Ta'adil and the, in, in the, in the, the tabaqat of, of, of the ruwat, when you see them, or, or the students of a particular imam, you see them when they're arranged in, in tabaqat, it's, it's, in, it's in accordance of mulazama, and it's in yeah. accordance with ruwaya. Not just because he met him one day and that scholar praised him. There could be some that have higher praises, but the ones who have uh, 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 you know, closest or their, their riwayah of him is aqwa. When they narrate from that imam, it's considered stronger. It's because kathatul mulazama. And, and they have more riwayat from him. And they're with him for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. His closeness is stronger because he was able to benefit more from him and knows his, um, his, uh, his, 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 his riwayat, you know, the things that he's narrated. He, he knows it better, his hadith and things like that as opposed to someone who may have been a greater imam in and of himself, but maybe was there once or for a year or a few months. And so his riwayah of that imam won't be as high as the other one. So the closeness in reality is, is how much you've benefited from him and not just how many times you visited on Umrah and Hajj and not just because he praised you one day in a sitting and said, oh, this is a uh, salary brother that we know of. That, that is not what gives you the stamp now to run around in your in your particular country and act like you're the you're the representative of the sheikh in that particular country and that you're the closest people to the closeness the correct understanding of closeness is the ilm that you benefit from that sheikh and not I just, just, wanna, I just i just want to add to that Akhi, you mentioned a point <laughs> and it's like the example i'm going to give of, of what you just said what the way i understood it is like if we look at the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and one of the companions, the one, the one that made the most mulazima, you know, being having that companionship and, you know, um, being close to the Prophet ﷺ was Abu Huraira. Now, if we look at Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, you can see a reflection. And when I say reflection, meaning you can see that knowledge was apparent with regards to that which he also uttered from a hadith. It wasn't just a thing where he's narrating yeah. that which he did. And how many times the Prophet ﷺ praised him, or how many times the Prophet ﷺ mentioned his name. It wasn't any of that, but rather it was just the knowledge that he learned from the Prophet ﷺ, from the ahadith, from him being close all those years and traveling with him. And then he passed it down to his students, the tabi'een, and they passed it down to, to the atba' tabi'een, and then so on and so forth. And now, alhamdulillah, the deen was preserved by Allah the Almighty from yeah. Abu Ghayr who being close to the Prophet Sallam and, and carrying on following him and benefiting from him. But now, subhanAllah, we get this completely, complete different picture where 
individuals from the West, you know, they or other places, they visit the likes of Sheikh Rabi and other ulama. And like you said, maybe it could be just a Hajj trip or Umrah trip or whatever. And then they get this thing where they portray to the ulama that they're spreading the deen. Yeah. Okay, and they're spreading Tawheed, they're spreading the Sunnah. So, of course, an alim hearing this, generally speaking, or anyone that wants khayr, praises them for that. And it's nothing to do with knowledge. There's no knowledge there put there with regards to that which the, the alim is probably calling him out or praising him. And then from that, like you said, he goes back to his place and starts claiming he's the close, closest one. And what's really funny, Akhi, that I just, up until today, just doesn't settle and I can't digest it, is that with regards to their actions and the way they carry themselves and the way they are with regards to the community, there is no reflection from that alim that they keep calling out. He praised me. He knows me. There is nothing there. But rather, yeah. hatred. People don't like that. People yeah. are, see them as harsh. They're harsh with the people. They're dealings with the people. So what benefit really have you benefited from that scholar? Yeah. And if you remember, just to go back to you mentioning Abu Huraira. Yeah. Um, is known as the Mukthir, yani, uh, the most hadith that he's narrated from amongst the Sahaba, yeah. the most hadith. And when he was asked about how, why was it that, why is it the case? He said when people would go and eat and people would go, other things, he would stick with the Prophet Sallallahu Even when he was hungry, to the level of starving, he would still stick with the Prophet Sallallahu So that shows the mulazama is the thing that raised him uh, so, so, so I think that's yeah there's a difference between mulazama of mashaykh and you seeing them on a constant basis and 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 you know learning the knowledge from them and you know their um their positions in certain affairs whether it's fiqh or aqid or how they've explained something and you can teach people afterwards what you've benefited so if you're explaining a book as a student later on, you can mention, oh, when Sheikh Rabi'i taught us this, when Sheikh Abdul Muhsin taught us this, when yeah. Sheikh Saleh taught us this. Those individuals can't do that. So a lot of these individuals who, who claim to be close to this one and that one can't do that. Rather, they'll just read a book and it's like storytelling, either just translating the book or that's yeah. it. If you didn't do mulazam of, of, of ulama and you didn't take these books directly from the ulama, there's going to be a khalal in your in your tadris in your or in your ta'lim, in your teaching of the people because it's uh yeah it's it's uh it's feigning knowledge in reality you haven't taken this knowledge in the traditional way uh which is taking it directly from the ulama rather either from audios or telelinks or visits and that is an ilm and then you, know, you can do jam of all of that in the end it's just gathering of information and in reality, it's not knowledge in, in the traditional way. And that's why you see a lot of jahat, a lot of, uh, you know, errors from a lot of these individuals in terms of manhaj and in terms of you know, knowing the titles of certain topics when it comes to the deen, but the application of it, they don't know how to apply it properly because they didn't take this knowledge directly uh, from the ulama. So, you know, as you said, they're not the correct, they don't represent those specific scholars in the correct way and they do more damage than they do good okay i wanted to ask you a question as well because you mentioned sheikh rabir and you mentioned that you benefit from him and how you saw him and how it affected you can you mention how his dealings were with regards to yourself when he saw you he doesn't know you you're a stranger to him at the end of the day and you know you being in his house his hospitality and then compare it to those that you know are in the west claiming mm -hmm. that they're close to the sheikh and the way they deal with others and the way they go about with regards to their dealings with, with the, you know, with other individuals that maybe they don't know or they do know. So I think that's really important because a lot of people, like you said, they don't know, you know, they're kind of subjected to Sheikh Rabi is the one that refutes. He's the one that, you know, takes people off the, the, the deen and what have you. And also, if you can clarify, because this word is mentioned a lot and a lot of people see it as a, you know, it's kind of a taboo or it's a negative thing, Salafiya. Just in a quick, quick, small, short phrase, what it means when someone says, you know, Salafi or Salafiya and what have you. So the uh, first part of the question, um, Sheikh Rabia, you know, didn't know me when I first went there. And likewise, yeah. others, you know, others who would just attend the lessons, but we didn't have any type of closeness to him. However, at times, like I said, we would pray at his masjid. And if there's people who visited me, for example, from, from Canada, or they're there on Umrah, and I would try to take them to meet him, uh, he would invite us to his house. 
just like that. Yeah. Just like and you don't even know. No, don't even know. Um, and uh, and so we would go to his house. He uh, he saw him at his old age and everything. Would come down to the to the maktaba to his library, uh, serve us you know tea and coffee and dates and things like that, and ask you know where everyone is from, um, how is the da'wah wherever we are, um, to give salam to the salafis you know that are there, and would give us like a general advice on uh, taqwa and and uniting you know the ranks of Ahl Sunnah. And call okay, him. how does that make you feel as an individual where you've been invited? Let's say you don't know his name, but just generally speaking, another individual from the country that you're in trying to study is inviting you to his own house, that's his premises, private place, and giving you tea and you know asking about you and where you're from and what have you. Especially when you're used to what you're used to, like what we're used to, especially when, when things like uh, conferences would happen, for example, in Toronto. And then you would see that not everyone is invited to the lunches. Not yeah. everyone is invited to the dinners. And some brothers, subhanAllah, would come into the musalla. So if a group of us are sitting in the musalla, like 10 of us, they would, they would come and invite a handful of us and leave the other brothers, knowing yeah. that they're sitting there and they would love to go, you know, benefit from whatever student was there at the time or, 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 that, you know, or whatever the case is, or spend some time with them or be a part of, you know, that type of gathering. But they would not consider breaking the hearts of those other brothers and leaving them out of it. Sheikh Rabi would never do that. Sheikh Rabi would never say, yeah, you three come and then uh, the rest of you tawakkul ala Allah. He would never, he would never do that. The ulama, they, they consider the heart, the, you know, the, the shu'ur and the, the, the feelings of, of the people. And they don't do stuff like that. But subhanAllah, in the West, with the type of tarbiyah that's in the West and the type of backgrounds and the type of uh, akhlaq that that exists and those things are not thought about so for me coming from a place like that and then coming there and whenever i would bring someone him inviting us to the house and same similar thing welcoming and at his age giving us time and coming down and things like that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unbelievable and not just him others other mashaykh who have invited me to their houses um i know you know their children know me being close to them uh, uh you know having dinner at their houses spending all night with them, offer me to sleep over at their houses, things like that. Someone who, you know, came from abroad and they don't know him like that, but, you know, and also being a new student, like uh, softening your heart and making you love ilm and making you love the ulama. Those actions make you love these ulama. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. But when you see the tasarrufat and the actions of these type of people who are supposedly, you know, callers to the deen and, and, and things like that, why is it then that we see the people who uh, have dealings with them uh, stop practicing, leave and then and, and, and go join hisbis, or leave and even apostate? That I know personally people who have apostated because of their, deal, their dealings with these people. Brother, brother one specific one, very close, I was very close to him, apostated because of the dealings of these individuals. And no matter what I tried to try to bring him back to the deen, he wasn't having it. So this wow. is the... This, SubhanAllah, do not represent Ahl Sunnah. They do not represent any scholar of Ahl Sunnah. They do not represent the manhaj of the Salaf at all. But it's it's like a hijacked, they've hijacked, SubhanAllah, the manhaj and just infiltrated it. And, and they claim, you know, they, they, they falsely claim that they're the representatives of it and that they, you know, are, are the ones who are calling to it, etc. But in reality, when you look at their actions and their speech and the fruits of the of, of what they've done, um, you know, you can have as many websites as you want and as many books translated as you want and as many conferences, yearly conferences as you want. But in reality, if if this is what's happening with even some of your community, there's a khalal. There's a khalal in your da'wah and there's a khalal in the sincerity. There's a, you know, there's a deficiency and there's, a, there's an issue with it. And that uh, da'wah is not just the, the stuff that you say in your lecture, really beyond that or more than that is your dealings with the people and how you behave with people and, 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 and considering the different backgrounds of people and considering the different levels of people and who's possibly a convert and people who are new to Islam and all of those things, subhanAllah. Uh, and the reality is why it's like that is because they haven't sought knowledge from the ulama. Those are the things you, the hikmah in da'wah and, and all of these things and that you're able to seek, you know, 
advice of the ulama in these things. You get that from spending time with the ulama. And you know, and someone who yani faqid al shay la yati. Someone who is oh, subhanallah bankrupt of something cannot give it. What, what, what is it that they can do? So for us to even expect it from people like that is is is, is pretty much far fetched. That these these are the things that you you attain from the majalis of the ulama. You see people who visit, for example, for Umrah, and you see the time that a sheikh gives them, and you see how they treat them. And some sheikh give them books, and some sheikh Rabi'a, from what I know, and from what I've witnessed and, and seen from him, a brother invited him to his wedding one time, and he couldn't attend, but he gave uh, someone an envelope full of money to go give it to the brother for, for as uh -huh. as it. This is this is how the. Uh, and it made dua for him and everything like that. Uh, so the karam of the Sheikh, Subhanallah. Allah Sheikh Rabi is known for that, known for his karam. So uh, people who he ha he's housed in his house and they've stayed and lived in his in the maktaba. Um, you know, and um, from those who know, yani Mecca at the time of Sheikh Rabi in Mecca, one of the students, closest students, or the closest student to him, and probably the one who benefited from from him the most in terms of um, ilm al-hadith is Hussein al-Ethiopi. Uh, Hussein al-Ethiopi, who uh, was very close to the Mulazim of Sheikh Rabi for years, and came as a shab to Mecca and was the imam of his masjid also. And oh, uh, yeah, brother, yeah. Yeah, you know the brother. So Hussein al-Ethiopi, uh, to me, in terms of ilm al-hadith, he's like the ulama in terms of ilm, ilm al-hadith. In terms of ilm and, and this and that, there's my sheikh that I know, they come to Mecca, they benefit from him. They go to oh. him and benefit. And he came in and he's still young, in his 30s, subhanAllah. And, you know, to the level of that, but he, because of his mulazam for Sheikh Rabia, but for Sheikh Rabia to give someone from Ethiopia, who probably may not have come as a Salafi or known, you know, Salafi to that level and didn't spend time with Mashaykh, obviously from here, maybe Mashaykh in his country, but came with maybe the Quran memorized, but learned from scratch, basically, almost from scratch, to give him that time and to build him to that level, subhanAllah, is, uh, is, is something ama uh, and amazing. And that, subhanAllah, it shows you the difference between uh, the, the mashayikh and, and, and these individuals, subhanAllah. Salah to guide us and guide them. Ameen, Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen.